Okay, that looks like that might be everyone that was sitting there in the waiting room. So kick us off. Well, kia ora katou, no mai hari mai. Greetings to you all and welcome to this EHF live session with fellows Justin Khan, Amrith Mahida and Rihanna Shah as panel members and we've got Chris Kagner as our moderator. Today's topic is incorporating AI and gaming in startups for competitive advantage. Now this is first of a many part series on regenerative AI. Chris and I have been having quite a few round tables with fellows and what could the fellowship collectively create as thought leaders and users and decided to broaden this conversation out to include the New Zealand ecosystem. So during this series, the fellows want to cover like risk and reward to New Zealand, security and regulations, well-being, right through to AI being used as a tool positively in business. So that's like today's session. It's about how can we use AI positively. A little bit about EHF for the first time as to one of our conversations. So Evan Hillary Fellowship is a collective of over 500 entrepreneurs, scientists, storytellers, creatives and investor change makers who want to make an impact globally from Aotearoa, New Zealand. These live sessions are informal conversations with the fellows, so you get to know them, what they bring to New Zealand, and are often the start point of an ongoing conversation that takes through to action. We'll be having about 45 minutes of conversation with the panel and then moving into Q&A and discussion with all of you during the next 90 minutes. Now, a little bit about our moderator, Chris. He's from Cohort 4, core here, and now lives in New Zealand and is a master in mentorship, coaching, agile training, and mindful instruction. He does a lot behind the scenes in some of New Zealand's biggest organisations that you're probably not aware of. And I'm excited to have him moderating this AI series over the coming months. So as I said before, this session is recorded and it will be up on our website. Just stay muted until you are going to ask a question. We can put your questions in the chat. And um, it is, if some of you need to leave, that is OK as well. Over to you, Chris. Thank you, Michelle. Kia koutou. Uh, really nice to see everyone. Good morning. Uh, I would love to introduce our panelists today. It's just a delight and a pleasure to have such an extraordinary panel with us. Uh, I'd first like to introduce by introducing Justin Kahn. He's the co-founder of Fractal, a marketplace to discover, buy, and sell durable game assets and NFTs, as well as Rye, an API to power e-commerce anywhere. Justin also co-founded Twitch, which was sold to Amazon in 2014 for 970 million. Amit Mahajan is the co-founder and CEO of Proof of Play, a company on a mission to create compelling and fun on-chain games that facilitate an inclusive and creative Web3 ecosystem. He also co-created Mini, My Mini Life in Farmville, and he founded the CEO of Toro, which was acquired by Google. Brianna Shaw works within finance and technology. She has worked on deals such as gaming company Unify, Unity Software's acquisition of Iron Source, and fintech company affirms public listing. She is the founder of ISTA Acquired, an education technology venture that redesigns schools for the 21st century. Brianna was a venture capital fellow at Parent Ventures Capital, where she advised and sourced early stage startups at MIT and Harvard, and was a fellow at the Harvard Innovation Lab. So I'll be inviting our panelists with some questions, and we'll, we'll start up with Amit. And I will invite Justin and Rihanna as well to follow on. And so, Ava, the question for you. How do you see AI changing the landscape of gaming in the next couple of years? Yeah, it's, a, it's something we think about daily. And um, so, so first things, you know, to give some context, you know, with gaming companies, so much of the cost of creating games is creating content. Right, and there's like different stages of content. There's you know, concept art, then you know you go from concept art to 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 prototype art to then final assets and so on. Um, and for you know, depending on the type of game, there's a lot of time that's put into the various stages of that. So the simplest way is that you know the idea of a concept artist has changed. Right, it goes from. Um, potentially uh, having to go into these like painterly kind of styles to typing a few words into uh, a like an AI generative system and be like, okay, I want to do a spaceport that looks like it's kind of like on Mars, but with three suns, right? Like a producer or game designer would tell an artist, you know, 
to do that and then they would go and do it and then maybe a few days later you get that back but now they can just go straight to the source and type it in and and, and the idea being is that like you know when you're when you're building something like a game you have an entire team of people that are trying to row in the same direction and someone's trying to set the vision and get people aligned and, and kind of go in the same direction the, the point of concept art is to, to kind of help people do that so I, you know the first thing is that the idea of getting a team kind of centered and, and seeing the same vision for what the game's going to be is a lot easier now. Um, so, so from our perspective, you know, we, uh, when we're thinking about new features in our game or we're thinking about, you know, trying something else out, like we can, we can start with actual imagery. Um, the second piece of that is then, you know, when we think about uh, actually going to final assets and, and, and Justin has an investment in, in this industry and we've messed around with them. There's a bunch of these companies now where you can basically go and say, OK, I need I need like a, a, an icon for a sword or I need a model for, you know, a, 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 for, for some for some item. And now you can actually go from, um, you know, going to like an art store like a digital art store where you're like downloading different asset packs actually going and getting a unique asset for your game and so now even when when it comes to prototyping the game you're just like very quickly getting to closer to the final product and you want and for, for developing games one of the key things is that like you don't really know if a game's fun until you start to like play it and so you try to get to like a playable slice of a game really fast and so this thing this all allows you to get to a playable slice really fast so so long story short, with games, it's just completely changing the way that um, I think games are made. And it just allows you to get to the, the, the heart of making a game first, which is finding the fun. And, and so, and I'm, this is just the surface level of it, but I'll, I'll, I'll stop there and see if others have something to add. But like, it's, it's really revolutionary. And I think it's, and, and more importantly, it's gonna bring down the cost, right? The time and the cost of making games is gonna go down straight up. And, um, yeah, so I don't know, Justin Brianna, I don't know if you guys have anything to add to that, but I was Yeah, I think um that was I mean, I think that's a really great summary. The uh, investment we were talking about earlier was this company called Scenario, which is this generative AI platform for games. And so like um mentioned, you know, like something like a third, I think, of the cost of developing a game is building the assets. And um, you know, no, the games can be like hundreds of millions of dollars or a billion dollars to produce now. And so this is like a tremendous part of the industry's cost is, is building assets. And um, there's a bunch of companies, one of them I invested in called Tenera that are working on creating that pipeline so that people can prototype faster, like I was saying, but also productionize the stuff that they generate. So like a lot of, you know, kind of like the V0 of these um, generative AI platforms like Midjourney and uh, Dolly, like one of the big problems with, making them production ready is like um the outputs aren't consistent or you might want to like create a bunch of things in the same style right but like people didn't know how to do that before and so now uh, a lot of these kind of like new tools um including like runway is another one um that's doing more of like um image and video generation is about like creating consistent output and like letting you like um more finely control your output and and create um so you can like make uh more easily put things in production versus just like the prototyping and storyboarding portion of it. Um, that's, I mean, it's pretty powerful because, you know, these comp companies, game companies that are doing this right now, it's like, I'm going to say, like a, an artist has to go produce this content if you want to like create a, you know, new assets for a game. And you could do it in seconds now as a user of one of these apps. And so um, like Scenario, like had 40,000 companies signed up in the last six months that they, they started, you know? And so I think it's, uh, you know, there's really high demand in the market for these types of tools because they allow you to move so much more quickly than, than before. It's kind of like Photoshop, like before when, you know, did, when uh, before Photoshop was around, people like did all the things in Photoshop, like airbrush, you know, touch-ups and airbrushing and stuff like that, but they did it like manually. And um, uh, Photoshop enabled a, a much broader audience or a set of people to like participate and do it much to this, you know, photo retouching much more quickly. But I think yeah, it's going to be super powerful for the industry, you know? Yeah, go ahead, Rihanna. Yeah, I was going to say to build on what both Ahmed and, and Justin are saying. So there's, of course, the like production side of gaming where AI is very heavily being deployed and it's like being able to in like a beautiful world, right? Like 
being able to have these like open player game or open uh player games where people can kind of play and it's like things get created as folks are playing like that would be that's a really interesting part of a like future vision of gaming but then there's also the sort of the nuts and bolts of like how do we enable creators to create games faster and so when we're thinking about the gaming landscape there's the folks who are like the ape like the triple a plus studios right that are producing these like games that are worth like millions and millions that take millions of dollars to produce and then there's like the like developer the individual developer who's like producing games and it's kind of like the fun thing that they're doing like on the side and so for so it really I think AI is really helpful for for all developers but especially for that like individual developer right like who's kind of doing this on the side who doesn't have millions and millions of dollars to deploy into a game so like, how do you produce how do you produce something quickly and then not just the production piece but also the monetization piece so how do we then take that and how do we actually monetize that game quickly and it also and AI helps that a lot with the like matching engine of like putting a game in front of the right people and then helping them stay on the game uh, etc and if we're able to monetize effectively it just helps more game developers stay within the space especially if you're a smaller studio and aren't already super well known and so lot, lots of different places we can go around the like visual media piece of it um, but there's also just a lot more like content uh, around it um, a lot more around the like development piece uh, and then I think one other area that neither of us have touched on where it, where AI makes a huge difference is around accessibility. So there, there are these like games that you produce and you can make them and being able to sort of automatically do certain things makes it a lot easier to make the games accessible to a lot more people because right now it's you have to program every line, right? It's just very, very expensive to do that. But being able to bring down the costs also then helps your console or your gaming platform understand what kind of gamer you are. It's like, oh, you can't see in your left eye. Like, okay, like let's figure out a way to have this stuff be in a certain place so you can actually see it. Or you're deaf and you can't hear the uh, explosion. It's like, let's generate captions really quickly to be able to tell you what's happening in the game. Um, and so there's just a lot of different things that you can do with AI in gaming. And I think the universe is uh, is quite broad and, and applicable in many different places. One, um, I'll, 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 turn off. I'll, oh, no, uh, uh, yeah, I'll add one more thing. Um, so like, you know, when we think about AI, we kind of split into two different buckets. It's like acceleration, right? So the idea like, you know, you get to assets faster, it brings down some costs, you don't need as many artists, all of those things, right? Um, and then there's the other one, which is just like, is the ability to create new capabilities. It's like enabling. And so, um, you know, like I, uh, my background is as an engineer, I, I can't, I have very little artistic ability and um for my entire life i've been creating programmer art right and it's just it, you know programmer art's called programmer art because i think you could imagine what programmer art looks like right and so now you know it's possible for people to become like you know one person shops right they're able to maybe you have a skill in one area and ai augments you in the areas that you have you know you don't have the skills and so you know we're seeing that across our org in other ways but like now like our community manager can go and like type some stuff into mid journey and be able to create stuff in the game and so one of the things that we've been thinking about is how this also affects user generated content so um you know someone in roblox or in fortnite or hopefully in our universe as well has the ability to go and basically type a few words into an ai generator and now create content that's within the style of the game they're creating content for so you actually enable people, especially, you know, maybe even children to be able to go and like create stuff just by talking to the computer and be like, I want to see X, um, which, you know, also creates a whole new category of games. There's a lot of folks that are starting to, you're starting to see companies pop up around creating games that are specifically um, the game itself is you describing what the game world is and the computer generating it for you, right? I, I'm sure we've all had ideas. Wouldn't it be cool if we had a game that did where you could do X? right? Fill in X with whatever your words are. And now the games are being given back to you by the AI. So there's like all of these different capabilities and we're only just scratching the surface of it. It's just like, it's like trying to imagine like what we could have done with the iPhone back in 2009 when it first launched and then trying to imagine TikTok. Like it's just, there's too many levels of successive generational leaps in terms of capabilities to actually know how it's going to affect the game industry broadly. But like, I, I think we can see a little bit ahead, but I'm, I think you know, five years from now, it's gonna be like, you know, oh, wow, we didn't even think of that. So, you know, one cool um, <clears throat> story that I, I have, like somebody using generative AI is um, 
or like I guess not the it's uh I, they were using Chat GPT. Uh, one of my friends who is not a programmer, he's a marketer, has this idea for a word game, kind of like Wordle. And so he asked, he basically described it to Chat GPT and then asked it to start outputting code, you know, to, and like it built this game. Like he's, he kind of iterated it programming the game for him. And this is someone kind of like Rihanna and Amit were saying, is, you know, this is expanding the market and people can create games. This is someone who like actually doesn't know anything about how to code. Um, and so, you know, that, I thought that was pretty cool because it was like a cool concept for a game. Like it probably would have cost him a couple thousand dollars to have someone else build it. And that's like, you know, he's going to launch it actually and see if people, it allowed him to prototype his game and see if people want to use it hmm. or want to play it. Yeah, I want to try it. Sounds fun. <laughs> It is. I won't give away the idea. It was. I mean, I could describe the idea, but I will. You know, someone else. Yeah, I won't give it away because it kind of told me in confidence. So we'll see what happens. I'll uh, I'll send it to you after it's after it's done. It's like a game. Once you know the idea, you could program it with Chat GPT in you know a couple hours. I think. So one of the things that I'm hearing is that generative AI is going to make creating the type of work that we do now much faster. Is going to accelerate but it's also gonna enable entirely new use cases. And Rihanna, I'd like to kind of see you with this question to start. How do you think generative AI can help some of these smaller game studios, such as those found in New Zealand, differentiate themselves in a larger, in a highly competitive market against some of these AAA plus game studios? Or for that matter, how might in the present independent game producers stay relevant when anybody can create an indie game, just as Justin was saying, without a lot of skill or background. Yeah, I mean, that's an interesting idea, right? It kind of is almost kind of like, how do you create something that someone wants to use? And like, that's the fundamental question here, right? It's like, I, I think the thing that generative AI does that's helpful is that you don't need to have a ton of resources to pour into something to actually produce something that's of quality, right? And of course, it's not we can't just like, you can't just put crap in. I mean, it's like generative AI will like give you trash sometimes, right? And you have to really be thoughtful about it. And so I think what is really going to distinguish what games get played versus not get played, it's really going to come down to quality. It's like, are you thinking about your, it's like fundamentals of like creating anything, right? Like, do you have a target audience in mind? What is it that you're enabling them to do through this game? Um, how thoughtful have you been in actually creating it and producing it? And I think the the thinking, the generative AI can't really do the thinking for you. It can help enable you and it can help kind of turn your thoughts into something that's more tangible, sort of like the game that uh, Justin's friend created. But the ideas are really going to have to be, be more fundamental. But what generative AI does do is it democratizes this. Like, I have an idea of a game. I don't, like, I don't have the time and I don't need to learn like, the like thousand different steps I need to take in order to produce something of quality. But what it does enable me to do is like have the idea and then be able to use a like, use like generative AI to be able to generate this idea and turn it into something that is usable. And then there's lots of platforms that can help you publish that game um, and just make it more accessible. And it just, it's a lot faster and it's easier to test. It's easier to pilot. And as a result, it's easier to iterate and just make changes to it. I'm after Justin, would either of you like to jump in? Yeah, I think that the it's AI yeah, can give you a lot of stuff, but it turns you know what's that what's that quote like movies are made on the cutting room floor, mm. right? The editing room floor. I, I I think the same thing is is like doubly true in the world of AI, where you can you have unlimited generate generative you know um, capability, and so it comes down to like you know what's your taste, right? Like what are you choosing to include? Um, the, um, the thing about, uh, the one thing I'll say with games in particular is that so much of game design is this idea of like game feel, right? Like when you play Mario, like just the, the physics, they just feel a certain way, right? Like there's a, there's a weightiness to it. Um, and you know, AI can help you program and get, get a version of that going, but like, does it feel right? Does it, does it like hit that dopamine center, that's a fundamentally human thing, right? Which is, it's, it's good for our jobs as game creators, I think for the time being, and maybe eventually there's a, you know, AI can figure out what 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 good game feel is too, but I don't think we're there yet. 
Um, mm-hmm. And so I, I do think there's like that umami to it, right? That indescribable uh, quality to what makes a good game and makes something like the, at least the interaction design feel good. And so, um, you know, I, I think that 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 ultimately, you know, comes down to, you know, are you are you thinking about your audience and all the things Rihanna said. I think um, for the opportunity for New Zealand game studios is probably the same as for everybody everywhere in the world, which is like every technology innovation cycle there there's like a chance to reset and you know kind of do more with less and so you know you become i've become more competitive with like a greater set of people because you can create more with like fewer resources you know and so i think the internet was like that for you know all sorts of developers of SaaS software and mobile apps and, and everything and um uh the ai tools are just like they're creative tools right they don't really i think you know kind of like um, these other two were saying it's like they don't replace taste and we already live in a world where there's like infinite content right like there's more games than you can play there's more youtube videos than you can watch more music things you can consume and so the problem is not or like there's it's not i don't people concerned about like there's you know ai is going to flood out human creativity because there's like too much content i think that's like kind of fake you know that's not real like um I think that the the cool thing about these AI tools are they allow people to be more creative and more expressive and up level their skill sets and um, create more you know do they maybe fill in the gaps where they don't have um, they don't have all the skills and so it makes actually creation more accessible to a broader number of people and so that both makes the market more competitive actually but it also makes um, it's an opportunity for people to. Uh, who maybe weren't otherwise able to compete to compete. So, like, I think the opportunity for for startups and, and for New Zealand companies, you know, game companies, is like that you can maybe like bring something better to market more quickly now. You know, hmm. that's actually I'll, I'll I'll plus one that and say that like for for a country like New Zealand that may not have you know um, access to talent like that a company in like LA would have for example, right, for, for creative talent or whatever, um, it actually levels the playing field. And so if someone has a unique idea, like that, that, like that, I, that concept of like the gap between idea and in market is just shrinking. Right. So it's the same, the same thing the internet did for ideas, right. Or the app store did it's allowed, you know, Flappy Bird was massive. It was some random dude in Vietnam who like came up with this idea and then that game blew up. And so it's basically democratizing the best ideas. And um, I think this is huge. I think this is like actually huge for, for, for a country like New Zealand because it just, you know, um, it, it enables, it's, I mean, the point of EHF is like, you know, uh, out, it's, it's like New Zealand solutions at scale, like global scale, right? Like, I'm, I'm, am I capturing it the right way? I mean, this this actually enables that, right? And mm-hmm. it, it makes that much more practical, pragmatic reality that, you can, that someone can do that. Mm-hmm. And I think at the end of the day, generative AI doesn't really replace like human creativity or storytelling, right? A good story is a good story and maybe it can help. Uh, maybe can produce something kind of generic, uh, but it can't really, I mean, it's like the games that are really thoughtful games that have a like beginning and an end, like all of those games take a lot of thought. And so it, at the end of the day, it comes down to who's going to put time into it and actual thought into it. I'm reminded of the Timbuk3 song, the future's so bright, I gotta wear shades. We've opened up this Pandora's box of content creation. And it's going to be less about creation and more about curation and filtering. Our sunglasses are going to be more important. Curious, uh, Amit, what are some of the ethical considerations when using AI in gaming? And how might you ensure responsible use? Yeah. Um, so, you know, we employ artists, right? And um, and, and and folks who have put a lot of work into their craft and to create, you know, um, create a differentiated skill set. And these models are trained off of other people's art, right? To the point where, like, I think you can actually get the Shutterstock, like, uh, I think there's a way to get the Shutterstock, like, um, tag to show up if you, like, enter the right prompt in, in some of the in some models. 
So the question is, is like, you know, who's like, yes, these things are generating new art, but it's actually built off the collective art of, you know, millions of people, right? Um, so there's a few things that we, 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 we think about. Like one is, do we go straight from AI to in-game? Or do we use AI as, a, as kind of a helper to help us do mock-ups and prototype work and so on? And then it's like, you know, there's a, there's a human kind of in the loop before it gets to our customers, right? Um, so that's been kind of like, because there's, there's like this idea of copyright, there's the idea of, um, you know, even outside of copyright, just are you building off of something that you created and taking credit for someone else's work and marketing someone else's work, right? And so so our, our solution to that is like just doing that. That may not be for everyone. I think I'm sure that's the overton window on this stuff is going to shift in the next few years and people are going to be like, it is what it is. Um, but like, even just for like delivering a proper thing to our users, like we want to say, hey, this is created by us and and it's okay for us to charge for it or whatever. And, and that's just like our company values. Um, but I think there's going to be a debate around this. Um, and so that's the first thing. The second thing is just, uh, you know, when we think about this from uh, like a jobs perspective, right? Like what, is, what does AI mean for folks um, who had, you know, like had like 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 an art like concept artist like you know it's it's I think you know the stuff's not quite there yet for like game design and, and some of those things but for like a concept artist you can argue that that is not a job anymore right like AI is that this is a solution to that like in fact it's going to be better at it um, and so part of what we're also thinking through is like how can we leverage at least internally how can we leverage people's skills in different ways or use AI to make them more effective at their at their job in some way and. And I'm actually not really super worried about AI completely replacing people's jobs. I like, I, I think that, you know, like we've talked about this, there's so, it's like, there, there's so much still around taste and quality control and all these other things that like, I actually think it's gonna end up being accelerant for many people. It just like, I like to think that like, you know, I, I, use, I use AI daily, I'm a programmer, I use Copilot, you know, we're, we're writing, you know, and basically the way that I describe it for me, at least in, in that in that kind of in that environment is before I was on foot and now I, I have a bike, right? Mm -hmm. It feels like I'm, or before I had a bike and now I have an e-bike, right? And it, it feels great. Like I don't have to write as much, you know, like I don't have to figure out syntax. Now my, the way I program has changed. Like I type a few characters and it auto completes stuff for me. It's amazing. It's like, it's unreal. And so um, I don't know if that's how artists feel when they're doing it, but I'll, I like to think that, that, you know, it's probably similar. It's just like, oh, I get to focus on the fun parts of, of my job, which are the creative thinking and the, the high level architecture problems and so on. So it actually has made the, the work more, more enriching. Um, yeah, that, I mean, that's how we're tackling it, but, um, you know, I'm sure it's, it's different if like you're a company like Scenario who's generating art for other people and how you're training your models and then they have maybe more ethical considerations. I'm curious, Justin, if you have any thoughts on this well i think there's like there's a probably short-term tactical question or legal question which is like how do you do licensing like i think licensing will get figured out because there are huge re repositories of user data whether it's like the text textual on reddit or like shutterstock for images or other um you know image repositories that are and what practically i think will happen is like the mo major you know, creators of these models will do deals with these data sources and pay them. And those data sources will maybe pay the people who are putting their content up there, or maybe just make that part of their end user agreement. And then those artists will like, you know, maybe they'll get compensated, but maybe not. And But it will be legal, I guess. Um, and, but I think like the, you know, the ethical question is maybe a little bit like more interesting. I mean, there's gonna be creative destruction of jobs for sure. Like I think that, um, and sometimes people will like it and be empowered to do something different and sometimes they won't. Like there was that viral post about like this Reddit artist, right? Who was like, a, I can't remember what kind of artist, but they're posting that like their job, they thought their job got a lot worse because they were, before they were like getting to design the characters themselves and that that's the part they liked. And then now they just like come up with a prompt and like put it, you know, they, I think they were concept artists and then they like generate the thing. It takes like 10% of the time or 5% of the time, but it was like, they, they didn't feel like that was fulfilling to them anymore. And I think that's like, realistically, that's going to happen to people. But like, 
you know, generally through the creative destruction process, like people get value in society and like more people are able to, you know, for every artist who had spent a lot of time developing a certain skill set that was difficult and well compensated, there's like nine other people who like don't have that skill set, but would want to work in that industry that the creative tools are empowering them. So it's not like, I don't know what the balance of like ethics or fairness is, but like that's just going to happen. And I think, um, you know, usually what happens is like, there's more creation. Like I, I would bet on like there being greater creation and more choice in the art that you get to consume in games. And uh, that would be the kind of, that, that'll be the ultimate outcome of it. You know? Yeah, I think, yeah, I mean, it's interesting that Justin, I mean, you're both talking about sort of the like legal implications of it and some of the copywriting plus job destruction or job creation uh, types of things. I think one other angle that we haven't fully talked about is also what are these models producing? Like if you are putting in, if you put in a prompt saying, hey, I want a CEO, right? Like, is it giving you a middle-aged white man? Because that's what the data set is, right? So it's like, where is the data coming from and what is it that it's producing and how much thought are we actually putting into something after it gets produced is also super important. Like, does it mean most games are going to feature certain male white characters because that's what a lot of games feature right now? And um, what do we do about that? And how do we kind of help people think through that? Um, and on the other hand, I mean, maybe it's possible that it's easier to create characters that we haven't quite thought about or aren't as in the, in the in the fray because we haven't programmed them as much and so there is a little bit of the representation angle also that we should be thinking about as we're thinking about ethics in gaming and ai i think i think it'll be the opposite now you can have your whole world you know you can customize every world before it's too expensive to create assets for everyone right. but now if i want to i'll live in an entirely asian populated gaming world Fair. where there will be no people who don't look like me i don't know if that's any better but that could be my choice you know yeah, I'm almost reminded of the promise of No Man's Sky and the idea of this vast procedurally generated universe. And it sounds like that would really be much more possible today than it used to be. And what I'm hearing from Ms. Carrero is that AI is not yet a replacement for human discernment, judgment, or taste. Uh, yet AI will be likely disruptive for creators and are seeing the signs of this. Pivoting a little bit, um, I'd like to take it back to Justin and shift the transition a little bit from the gaming industry to the world of startups. And Justin, I'm curious, the question that we asked Amit about gaming, I'll ask this to you, the startup ecosystem. How do you see AI changing the landscape of the startup ecosystem in the next couple of years? I think it's probably like similar, just like different applications where, you know, there's gonna be all these tools that reduce the cost of like thought work, you know, like, or yeah, there's so all these different types of things that you do in your startup that take, you know, that you would have a person for, you know, you'd have to hire someone to do, you'll be able to do in like much cheaper, much more quickly. And so like one example is um, one of my friends is starting a company that does um, lead data. They're like adding data that, to leads like sales leads right so they um you know previously you would need to have a someone do research and say like um you know like basically this thing you know takes in all these data sources you know public company data or like the company's blogs and stuff like that and then like you can ask it questions about like you know whether basically that are relevant to like you selling your product into that organization right like do they have these certain kinds of problems, you know, things like that, or like, do they, um, you know, what are the, like, for example, I mean, it's kind of complicated, but they're basically like, you know, if you're selling, um, you know, forex trading services to this company, then other check companies, then you can like kind of read all their public filings and see if they have those kinds of problems, right? And that's something that you would have to do the research for before, but now like uh, AI can do it in like an hour, right? And like for your entire thousands of leads list, like very simply. And so, um, you know, that's a, I think there will be a lot of examples of things like that, that just reduce the cost. And so it enables like what used to be a 10 person company, like you could do that with five people now, or you, you know, and you can do it much more quickly. And so 
I think every part of the, like every department inside a company um, will have things like that, uh, that will like allow less, fewer people to do more. And so, you know, it's probably that happened before, you know, multiple times in the history of, history of startups, right? Like the, the internet and then mobile enabled this like much more broad distribution um, for companies that were much smaller, you know? And so th that's um, at cost to come down to like the cost of starting a company to come down like AWS and all these like cloud computing services were similar. Like when I started 20 years ago, we like racked our own servers and built our own server infrastructure. And that was like a cost, you know? And then now, then you could just like spin up AWS for like $10. You can like spin up, you know, host your, your, your web app or whatever. And um, I think this is another thing that will like increase speed of market and reduce cost for the companies. I don't think we're at the point yet where you can be like, give me a startup idea and then use auto GPT to like actually execute it or anything like that. So, you know, you, the founder, the founders themselves are probably safe for now. Haven't commoditized founding, founding things just yet, but we're close oh, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think one of the interesting things around uh, just the generative AI landscape is I think where startups have a ton of potential is really around the verticalization of AI. So it's really at the application layer where, because some of these language models, like AI is not new, it's been going on for a long time, but there are certain things that we can spend a lot more time on where you can personalize a lot more stuff. So for example, in like healthcare, like there's tons of different applications that you can build on top of a lot of these, uh, a lot of the technologies that generative AI has enabled, it's like whether it be uh, recording audio during patient visits, transcribing them quickly and actually doing it well, um, then using that to actually make give more context and produce a more rich history or more rich health history that then goes with you from doctor to doctor or from just throughout your your life cycle. So there's a little bit of that uh, that is getting built, and there's just a ton of different things we can do around that. And then there's of course there's lots of different software sectors where we're seeing development, whether it be in productivity, whether it be of course in gaming, uh, whether it be legal, industrial, finance. So there's just a lot of different applications that exist. And I think based on some of the language models that are built, uh, there's a ton of potential and there are a lot of startups getting getting built in this space. Yeah, what, one of the things that is kind of interesting, though, is like the defensibility of all of this stuff, right? Like, um, I don't know how many, like when OpenAI came out with plugins, how many YC companies they ended up killing like half the batch <laughs> it's like some ridiculous number of yc companies that were in development were like well we guess we got to pivot now open ai just like implemented the purpose of our entire business so um it's interesting like definitely like um you know when cloud computing came out like being like a server hosting company became less lucrative but being a cloud server management company became way more lucrative Right. Like, you know, at Zynga, we were like one of AWS's biggest um, customers. In fact, you know, it was like us and Netflix were like two biggest AWS customers back like, you know, this like 10 years ago. But we didn't use AWS directly. We used something called RightScale, which was sitting on top of AWS and allowing us to do essentially a bunch of like higher order functions. So what's what's interesting is I think like, you know, we're in this conversation right now and anyone who's listening to this you're listening to us because you're curious about AI and you're looking for like, you know, help on like maybe how to get started or business ideas or whatever. It turns out that building companies that help people do what this talk is trying to do is actually valuable at this moment, right? Because a bunch of people, they, they see the potential, they keep hearing about it. Um, and, you know, I'm in blockchain and there was a bunch of, there was a hype cycle on this before. And you get all these like fake influencers who were trying to like help people get into blockchain. But like, you know, with AI, it's like a real thing. It's complicated. It's like hard technology. You can go and use it, but then like how to go from just like using chat GPT to like creating, you know, like actually usable things with this. I think people need help with that. And then when you start to look at it from enterprise level, you even need more help with that. And so um, I'll make a strong statement and it'll be on this call. It'll be recorded forever. But I actually think that open AI doesn't have a defensible moat as a company, at least on the consumer side. And um, I, so I think what you're going to see is that there's going to be more and more of these these language models getting created, and um, and so for them, I think their business is almost going to be entirely focused on serving the enterprise. 
And I think, you know, if there's one common theme, it's that AI changes literally every part of a business, right? It touches everything. And knowing that, that it's a huge amount of opportunity to help companies in one or two specific niches in the enterprise, right? How do you apply AI to, you know, generate your marketing copy? How do you gener- use it to generate your, your sales leads? How do you use it to, you know, generate game assets? Right. There's like a very clear thing, which is like maybe the AI model is commoditized, but the interface to that model isn't right. You know, like if you look, there's this old graphic for Craigslist where there was like, you know, a dozen links to Craigslist. It was like, you know, buy and selling and like renting apartments. And then someone went and like kind of connected each of those links to a different startup that took that piece of Craigslist and like, you know, created an entire company based around it. So for like, you know, renting rooms, that was Airbnb for buying and selling, that was eBay. So the question is, is like for all the things you can do in chat GPT today, how do you create a, an app that's a specific version of that thing that makes it easier to like do the prompt engineering under the covers? I mean, Scenario is doing this. All they're doing is like taking whatever, you know, inputs you're giving it. And then they're constructing a prompt and helping you kind of refine that prompt to get the game asset you want. And so there's just a huge new number of, you know, startup opportunities that have been created by this because the type of application you need to build to use AI is fundamentally different than what's come before. Um, so I think it's a pretty cool time to be an entrepreneur, especially if you don't have an idea yet. Um, some really, really cool stuff there. Kind of agree, but I, I, I think, um, you know, like the question is like, do these LLMs become good enough or like do they approach do they do they accelerate faster than than you these like kind of individual use cases like do we approach agi and you could just kind of ask it anything and ask it to do anything or do the enterprise specific use cases like do they build enough kind of like of a, a mode around their like specific use case i don't really know what's going to happen i think though i kind of agree with you that like all these startups building ai i think i actually think it's like not a great time to be an ai entrepreneur necessarily i think it's hard to figure out an idea that's like that has long term defensibility i think the whole uh, creation of these ai features is like pretty deflationary basically it's a cost set like you know kind of like what i mean is like bing ads you know uh bard or sorry no the bing ads like uh being AI or whatever, and then Google will add Bard, and like they're now they're kind of both forced to provide these customers uh, their customers these AI features, and the real winner is like the people lower down in the AI in the in the stack, you know, like Nvidia or whatever who's selling them the GPUs, and I I don't know that they're like making any more money because they have these AI features, and I think that's going to happen across the stack, like Intercom, which was this like you know, like Intercom, uh, the the um, customer support interface, they like very quickly added these like AI summarization and like rewriting for their agents. And I, th- I, I was like, oh, that's pretty cool. But I'm sure there were like, you know, there were other startups that were like, we're going to be the AI Intercom and allow the agents to like, re- you know, replace themselves with, with AI or whatever. But like Intercom can add those features faster than you can build the customer base and the distribution. I think it's it's really hard to think of like I've been trying to think of like what's an AI startup that I would actually want to start and I think it's really hard to think of something where the incumbents are not able to you know very quickly add AI features I think it's a lot different than like you know 15 years ago when like mobile was starting and like nobody had a mobile app and like um, now there's a lot of tech companies with distribution to, to customers and they can like very quickly add these AI the AI APIs are available to them as well you know and so, um, you know, I think it's got to be something where you are, because of AI, it's either like a second order company, like something, the world's going to change in some way because of AI, and then like, what does that enable? Um, or alternatively, it's something where you can like aggregate a new customer base because of AI, you know, and I, I don't really have any good ideas, but that's how I think about it. I do think there are two interesting places in the sense that I think the place where AI can produce a lot of value is, or where you can create a startup that does have some form of defensible mode is through partnerships. And so I think some of the stuff that we see with some of the larger companies partnering with some of these startups, I think there is some value to that. And I feel like if you end up embedding yourself enough within a customer's ecosystem, like if you become sort of not the AGI part, but if you are sort of more context-based and you sit within an organization and you're able to kind of 
read all of the information within that organization and produce value in that specific large organization. I think there's a lot of value there, which is pretty interesting. Um, I don't know who builds it and I don't know how you actually get it done. Um, and actually like tying all of the threads of these super large, very complicated organizations, but I can see a lot of really interesting value from being able to do some of that knowledge management and being able to sort of uh, more specifically create specific AI use cases within contexts. Very robust. Thank you. Thank you. I have a couple questions left, and then we'll turn it over to the audience. Justin, I'm curious, you know, we, we've been talking about how companies can use generative AI to accelerate and augment their capabilities. There's been some discussion around differentiation. I'm curious to hear some real world examples. Um, can you share some examples of how your investments have utilized AI to drive growth and innovation? Um, I, think, I think I probably covered my best ones, you know, like with the uh, scenario and, and, um, and like this uh, kind of an example of this like uh, lead lead school uh, data startup. I think there's, you know, kind of rehashing what I said. I think there's probably like every slice of, of of every department in a company. Like if you do anything that requires kind of like basic, you know, repeatable thought applied to it to like get the job done. Like eventually there'll be an AI tool that that does that. You know, great. And yeah, I, I would describe it. I mean, the way we describe it internally is everyone has an intern that's that's always working 24 seven, but they're like clearly an intern. And so the, 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 you have to like delegate, but verify. Yeah, I love that. I love that. Mm. Mm. Rihanna, I'd like to leverage some of your considerable experience and slightly pivot a little bit. How do you think AI is going to change the landscape of public companies and public company mergers and acquisitions? Uh, yeah, all, all views here expressed are my own, do not belong to any company I work with. But um, I think from a public company perspective, I mean, you see this arm, this like AI arms race, right? It's like, obviously, there's sort of some of the stuff going on within search where there's a ton of like, who's going to build the better search engine um, based on based on AI, utilizing AI, um, who's going to make it available to more people, who's going to make it more accessible, um, and then how do you actually make money from it and are ads the answer to continuing to make money from it by, by providing this better search service. So there's that. But I think when you just think about the various the various tech giants, they're they're spending a lot of time just on key partnerships, right? So there's a lot of end user devices that can utilize some of these partnerships and make them better. So some of these home devices that can talk to you, it's like those can get better. And so there's there are certain things that the monetization of it is still under question, but I think it's, I mean, there's the public companies that are building out sort of the like user facing stack uh, that are spending a lot of time on figuring out where they can uh, where they can optimize what they're already doing through AI. And then there's at the bottom of the stack, there's of course the companies that are based on compute. And so the companies that are building the chips that are going to enable enough compute power to be able to do AI faster and do it cheaper. Uh, Cause right now, if you look at it, it's pretty, it's pretty expensive, right? It's like it, chips are not necessarily built to generate the amount of data that we're, we're generating right now through AI. And so as we start to optimize chips, as we start to optimize some of the compute power, it just makes it a lot, it creates this foundation that allows more AI and more data to be able to generate it on top of it and used on top of it. And so there's going to be different types of public companies that are going to be at different parts of the, of the ladder when it comes to AI, both from a data perspective and from a powering the data perspective. Excellent, thank you. I'd like to turn it over to our audience and audience, I invite you to raise your hand, just click this reactions button at the bottom and raise your hand and I'll call on you to ask your question. Michelle. Yeah, just while others are thinking of a question, um, during just get, if you can pepper through and maybe put them into the the chat any resources that will sort of like 
best reads kind of thing so that because there's obviously so much information out there what are some sites or books or thing areas or companies that we should be following or watching that are, are really good in this space and utilizing the space just so that we're um honing in our our thinking and our reading i have a great recommendation for this um it's how i keep up to date on the stuff it's called ben's bites have any of you heard of this it's literally like you get an email every day, which is just like a summary of uh, a summary of all of the like kind of AI happenings. Um, it's like a sub stack. Um, I think I, I think I'm just on the free one, but yeah, this is like it's the, the reality is it's moving so fast that you might as well just read whatever is just the newest information, because who knows, like if you go back and read something from three months ago, it's probably outdated already. Um, Yes, the Ben's Bite stuff is pretty good. Um, and they have a, like a good mix of like kind of technical stuff, some like regulatory stuff. Like the, the one yesterday was about Sam Altman like going to talk to Congress. Um, you know, some applications that are interesting. So it's 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 a good mix of stuff. I'd I I'd highly recommend this. Just signed up. Thanks. Good. I think I Heard about it before but i didn't i didn't actually put my email address the, in so now you've, you've the, tipped me over <laughs> the problem is i'll have no takes for things like this if everyone's reading if everyone has the same upstream sources yeah, you just gotta <laughs> unmute <laughs> first you un unmute first and just say it and then you know you look get to look smart it's like jeopardy you have to like buzz in <laughs> <laughs> foundational layer we've got a question in chat from our uh random whale and then jameson i'll get to you so this from random whale do you think there's sense in provenance for specifically trained or biased AI models, especially since homomorphic encryption and ZK is coming to live on chain? So you can hide and pay while your AI models on chain. Uh, for instance, since Grime shared her approval to use her voice to generate AI songs, wouldn't it be cool to have the model for her voice deployed on chain? And from there, it will be verifiable provenance, programmable royalties for artists, derivative works, et cetera. Go ahead, Thomas. You want me Sorry. to take this one? All right. Um, I mean, I think this is where we're going, right? If, if you know, the blockchain side of it aside, I, I do think like, you know, there's two, there's two sides to this. There's the, what does it mean to be an artist anymore? Right? Like, what does it mean to be a likeness? And so there is like, we do have in the legal world, a set of like, kind of you know, laws around this already, this idea of like likeness rights and all of the other stuff. And our legal framework is actually pretty well equipped to deal with those things. So yes, you can use AI to generate a song using Grimes or Kanye. For those that don't know, there's this like, there's like a, been a bunch of songs that came out recently for uh, like The Weeknd and Drake, and they were like good songs, right? And like, um, so then Grimes came out and she was like, hey, like, you know what, like use, feel free to use my my likeness to generate AI work, which is actually a super, I think it's like almost like a jujitsu move of this entire thing. Um, and so, but in terms of monetizing those things, um, uh, you know, the copyright and likeness laws still apply. And so, you know, and just maybe you have an opinion here as a, as a creator, I, I think you, you've, you probably deal with some of this stuff, but like, but ultimately like, I, I think that this is like, if I were an artist that had a likeness that was worth monetizing, I would absolutely go do what Grimes just did because it's, 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 it's basically all you're doing is you're getting leverage on your, on your existence, right? Now, if there's a thousand Grimes songs and one of them blows up, that's like really good for you as Grimes. Uh, so I think it's like super smart to do this. And then the on-chain stuff, like, you know, there's a, there's a company called Audius, uh, which I think, you know, Justin, you may, you're, you're like, somewhat involved with it's a start by front around my living room yeah right and they're basically doing programmable on-chain royalties and like they're doing this for music and i mean plugging this in would make a lot of sense um once it once like likeness starts to become like something that you can monetize more efficiently through ai yeah i think the difficulty i mean I'm, you know audience is really cool uh, cool technology and the, their idea was like to create this programmable world where you kind of automatically get paid paid if you contribute music into this platform um, and it like handles all the, the royalties and, and stuff like that. But 
the problem is like the alternative music distributions or the main music kind of distribution system is set up in a way that they don't really want transparency to the artists you know like that you have these intermediary labels who are collecting all the you know like royalties and sync rights and plays from the from the, the major like streaming platforms and they're not really providing transparency back to the artists and it's pretty ha hard to break that monopoly i think um so i'm not sure if like this will practically you know the ai generative ai will be the thing that like changes that to be honest Maybe that's depressing, but like uh, it's uh, it's pretty cool that you can like make a Kanye song. You know, I think a lot of that will be like promotion. Like right now, what the first things that will happen are people will use this to create like, you know, like David Guetta made like a Eminem vocal tag and like they made an ID for like a set, you know, and it was like a viral moment on his Instagram. But he's not gonna monetize that song, you know. Jameson, you had a question. Yeah, I just posted it in the chat. In chat. Oh. Ah, thank you. Uh, do the panelists see any likely convergence between advances in the broadening consumer use of AI and the trend of capturing value from digital exhaust and user thought or action influence, i.e. surveillance capitalism? Any impacts on personal privacy, enterprise economics, wealth disparity? I mean, one that comes to mind is I think there will be better and better propaganda that is like, you know, you will be able to tailor the messaging. You know, you already saw that kind of like starting in 2016 where there's these armies of bots that are trying to like influence what people think on Twitter by just posting, you know, extreme views or like supporting certain candidates or whatever. And then I think, um, you know, that will like explode. The people will create more and more realistic, like ch chat, GPT-4 is like, you know, as smart as people on the internet or, or smarter. And so, you know, I think there will be more and more tailored messaging to that is like tailored to individual people's psychographic profiles. People will collect like Cambridge Analytica, right? Like there'll be, a, there are other actors who will collect that information that will be private enterprises and also like foreign governments and they will create profiles of people and then you you know kind of message you more individually about the, and you know you can create like a whole multimedia landscape to like drive home certain messages whether that texts and tweets and all the way to videos you know like um that show up in your tech tiktok feed you know and so i think that's like um inevitable i guess and like kind of you know that's a that's a huge problem and even if we like legislate that in the u.s or the west there's like other places on the internet or like other you know foreign governments who that will not be subject to those um you know kind of ethical and legal uh restrictions and we're not like super equipped i don't think we're even really equipped to deal with like the kind of like ongoing psyop uh, that foreign governments are running on americans on like through our own like public internet and so i think that like this is the next level and we have like no uh, um we have no capability to like to do anything about it yeah i think that's why you should move to new zealand <laughs> new zealand has internet too right um i mean while i i think the other the other side of that, to some extent, is um, thinking about education and thinking about how we're utilizing, a, like, just AI in education and how we're thinking about AI in education and how we're prompting critical thinking. So there's, I mean, one of the biggest use cases of AI so far has been in education, right? Like, people writing papers, writing poetry, writing a lot of things um, using AI. Uh, and so some of it is, like, how do we how do we work with our education systems to help people think critically, um, help people think about quality um, and help people distinguish between analysis versus description, which is a lot of what AI works on. Um, and so I think there is, I mean, it's like like any other, other time in history, um, as stuff gets more personalized and as stuff is able to kind of be directed at you in a certain way to persuade you in certain ways, some of what Justin is talking about. It's like, how do we also empower people to, think critically and think about what they're reading on the internet and uh, how that's actually impacting their life. 
I, th I think that's um that's another great point. It's like you know AI has the potential. It's already being used, right? Like we're using AI models and like the social media sites to customize what you see based on your revealed preferences, like what you click on and watch, right? And um, that's so we're all, but we have now the capability of creating like models and and consumer tools that you know do that in all different areas of your life including edu i think education is a really great one because you know you have this ability now to create customized education tools that teach people at a, i think a much more um tutor tutor people a much more interesting degree than you have been in the past and so um it's not all negative you know there's like a, a lot of opportunity to like up level humanity with ai tools mm -hmm. Same it's kind of like the internet i think it's like the internet might have been is it was it good or bad like there's probably some pretty bad consequences and some pretty good consequences you know thank you Sian, would you like to jump in yeah i'm just checking you can hear my audio just great thank you oh awesome hi i'm sung jay i work as a project manager in health new zealand so it's the public healthcare system in New Zealand. I'm really interested because it seems like healthcare is a very um, viable place for innovation, gamification, and AI, especially because there's limited public funding, constant loss, and poor retention of staffing, especially nursing resource. And we're losing a lot of resources um, to global uh, workforce. Um, but that's in theory, and I guess a lot of the difficulty is the ethics, the AI governance that's being set up. Um, the data governance, health privacy, poor data quality in the system, and then the old and divided tech infrastructure around the country for healthcare system, and whether the audience is ready for innovation. So I guess my question to the panel and everyone else is, what would you do if you are the mediator in the public care system? What what other applications that just make sense to bring in that are already ready? And then as a potential founder, what are some of the ways to navigate through a healthcare landscape from your expertise? Um, I, I can share this, I can share an anecdote here just because, you know, it's so there's these stories about AI correctly diagnosing like, um, like rare conditions. So at minimum, just like it's an extra pair of eyes. Right. But, um, I, I think the whole, like, keep a human in the loop thing makes a lot of sense. It allows you to get that extra pair of eyes without having to, um, potentially upend the entire system. Cause I think going from, okay, like you have a, you know, a radiologist, like looking at your, at your x-ray going from like someone just, you know, today, which is someone goes in there, they take a look at it, maybe they miss something, you know, it's easy, you know, humans are fallible um, to uploading the x-ray to a machine that then gives you your diagnosis. I think there's, that, that's a, that's two ends of a spectrum, right? And so I, I think it's important to remember this thing is a spectrum of how much you want to integrate. And I, I think it's actually, it, it'd be like, I, I'd love to hear a counter argument to this, but I think it'd be foolish not to use AI today to actually add as an extra pair of eyes, right? Like, um, I think the danger there is the same thing you see with self-driving cars, which is people just get like too reliant on the system and then are not, awake at the wheel when something goes wrong they take control back so i think it's, it's, it's important to like you know put maybe checks and balances in of, of like actually like okay did you view this yourself check did you have the ai look at it also check and then you kind of go through like that and, and ensure that you know the, there's always a human in the loop um but uh but yeah I, I i mean um i'm excited for that i think it'll bring down the cost of, uh, cost of care it'll make it more uh make it more likely that rare conditions get diagnosed. I, I, I think it's just huge amounts of upside uh, for this. And that's not even getting into like research, right? Like the ability for AI to help us develop new vaccines to, and, and this, is, this is the utopia argument for AI is that like, you know, if we actually manage to pull it off in a way that doesn't end up being, you know, completely disastrous for humanity that, you know, they'll potentially solve a bunch of our problems starting with, you know, discovery of new drugs, helping us cure rare diseases, just helping us scale healthcare to everyone, that kind of stuff. 
there's also a lot of really interesting personalization that can happen, right, with AI and healthcare. And I think that's super expensive to do right now. It's like right now you need to have a concierge doctor, or you pay $40,000 copay per month to get that level of service. And if we're able to make that more accessible, it's like we're able to, I mean, we have like, we have the genetics, we can kind of predict a lot of things about people. We can predict a lot of things based on history as well and based on your genetics. And so if we're able to, I mean, we have enough data at this point to be able to actually really effectively predict certain things. So it's like, but the hard part is how do you take that from the lab and from like a research model of like where like our random startup is working on it to actually being able to integrate it within a healthcare system that is fairly antiquated to some extent, right? It's like we're in, a, I was having a really interesting conversation yesterday with someone who is sort of the like godfather of like genomics to some extent. And we were chatting about how essentially it's like right now our system is built at being able to diagnose disease, but it doesn't really optimize for health. So it's like, how do you optimize human performance rather than, oh, somebody got sick, they're going to go to the doctor, we're going to prescribe you medication, then we're going to see what happens. Uh, but how do you, if there are ways to, to ensure that people don't get sick in the first place and are able to expand lifespan um, and expand sort of the ability to, to live a good, healthy life, uh, what are the things that we need to put into that? And I feel like AI is a really valuable uh, way that we can actually really customize a lot of this data and um, understand uh, people more deeply. I guess I actually am like a little bit of a, probably a bear case on both of those thoughts, which is like, I don't know, I feel like I'm kind of negative about AI, but but, <laughs> but I think that like, it's not going to reduce healthcare costs because most of the cost is not a doctor, and a, at least in the American healthcare system. You know, is that what I know? And most of it is like cost disease from having these like ballooning infrastructures um, and the administrative overhead. And then also... Uh, the fact that people are living longer and they're old and you know that's um the really yeah but for, fu but for functioning democ for functioning democracies with universal health care it sounds like you can actually get much uh, increase the the average floor quality of health care in, in, in those other countries <laughs> i don't know maybe 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 so i uh, i don't know what the cost disease of health care looks like for in new zealand uh, but um and then um, I forgot what I was going to say about Rihanna's point. So never mind. You know, I don't know. We'll see what happens. Oh, oh the, the other thing I was going to say. Sorry, what you're saying is like people need can get more personalized healthcare, which I think is true. But I'm a little bit like skeptical on whether personalization is the problem in healthcare. I think for most people, willpower, like you know what, like most people, the, the, there's like certain types of conditions that are very very prevalent in the west and you know that are the major problems that people have like cardiovascular disease um diabetes and we know what causes them like their lifestyle you know there's a lot of like lifestyle things that you don't i'm not i, I guess and i'm not a doctor so i you know what do i know but like it just seems to me that like mostly people um many people know what they need to do but it's a willpower problem it's not like a personalization problem i don't, I don't know if they maybe if they have a better ai like a doctor that will help them i don't know maybe rihanna convince me otherwise i mean i think some of what you're also talking about is i don't know as much as it's a willpower problem as much as it's an infrastructure problem so like if we talk about obesity for example right like if you live in a place where you don't have a grocery store and you don't have access to fresh produce, like it's not like you don't have the willpower to eat well. It's that you don't have access to stuff that isn't dessert being considered a snack or lunch or dinner. And so I think it's a that's like a greater like democracy or like a greater like America problem to some extent. Um, but I do think like I feel like there's almost like various segments of the population, right? Like there's, po there's segments of the population that need, need more like basic shit, like access to produce. And there, there are segments of the population that already have access to a lot of that stuff. But it's like, if there are certain things in your lifestyle that make you more likely to get diabetes or cancer, and if there are ways to alert you earlier on, like maybe there is a part of the population that does have the power to take that, uh, to take that indication and actually make changes to their lifestyle. Like, do I want to be motivated to exercise more? Like, maybe there's a way to motivate me, right, uh, based on that. So I don't think it works for everybody. And I don't think it solves the like fundamental problem of uh, infrastructure. But I think at the same time, it is more, I mean, I'm more hopeful for it than I am uh, bearish on it. 
I think there's a bit of both. I think one is the willpower aspect, but infrastructure. If something is already near you and that's a good option by design, then you don't need as much willpower to do the right thing. So in New Zealand, what happens is a lot of the new fast food chains come into areas of New Zealand where there's already pre-existing obesity problems. And that in itself by design increases the risks in that community. So I think there's by design. And then I think there's definitely a power of how can we make willpower more accessible, more easier to actually initiate an action. And maybe gamification is the next way to utilize the tech savvy new generation of workforce. Um, so yeah, I think it's all interesting. Thank you. Thank you very much. So this question comes from Murdoch. What strategies could gaming companies use to combat cheating in games? For instance, aim bots for multiplayer first combat or first person combat games, such as Call of Duty, or AI learning to mimic pro gamers and then being exploited in competitions where people can enter their AI doppelganger into competitive tournaments. Um, I'll, I'll pick this one. Um... I mean, uh, we, we saw this play out with chess, right? Where, um, you know, years ago, DeepMind uh, started to, to beat human players. And if you go on chess.com, there's like, you know, um, potentially you're playing against boss potentially. So um, I, think there's two, I think there's two ways to approach it. One is that um, obviously for you know, for high level competitions, you, it, it actually brings people to, to have those competitions in the real world, right? Like if you have whatever the, the world championships of, of League of Legends or something, like, you know, you actually do them in the real world, you have ads, ads verified. Um, for online competitions, um, it's, a, it's a little bit more tricky. And I, I think AI is also the solve this problem a little bit, though that hasn't, I will caveat this with saying that has not yet been true. So, you know, we're seeing this in, um, and for example, in, in people doing like, uh, like written content for like, for example, I'm writing an essay for my college class and there's something called zero GP, GPT zero, which is supposedly used to detect when something is written by an AI, but it doesn't work. Uh, and so, so, the, but the theory is that AI can use to detect AI and it's going to be like a cat and mouse game on the stuff. Um, you know, in terms of, you know, AI learning learn to make pro gamers, like I actually lean into it. You actually have competitions, which are, uh, you know, it's like, yes, we're all going to enter our battle bots into the competition and let them go at it and see who can, who's the best AI coder. I think that's a different type of game. Right. Um, but yeah, in terms of combating cheating, um, I, I, I think the real, the mitigating factors there are using AI to help detect it. And then also just doing stuff in person. Um, well, let's, that's where my head's currently at on it. And then leaning into it when it makes sense, you know, to actually, um, I think they're doing the start now with chess too. They have like AI, AI focused competitions to see if you can build the best chess, chess engine and so on. Um, and then humans use that to skill up. It's actually pretty cool. It's like you have a, a, a training partner to play with. We used to watch the gladiators and now we watch battle bots. Justin, would you like to chime in for Rihanna? I mean, I think Ahmed kind of covered covered it. Um, yeah, I don't know if I have anything intelligent to add. The floor is free. The microphone is free. What questions do you have? We could go back to the second, the, the question before, which was the, um, the kind of dystopian or the panel, the convergence between consumer use of AI and the trend of capturing value from digital exhaust and user thought mm. action influences. I thought that was kind of interesting. We didn't talk about like wealth disparity or personal privacy or enterprise economics. I don't know. I thought that was an interesting question. Let's go for it. What would you like to kick us off with, Justin? What would you like to explore there? 
Um, I don't know. I don't know if I had a fall off for that. What are, what are the things that are going to happen? What are the impacts of a, of AI going to be on on privacy? Mm. And we've got a, a a tease from Random Whale. You have even more dystopian questions. Oh no, I want to hear that. I want to hear the vibe. Dystopian. Ask, uh, just that's ask the best it, time. The vibes are. Yeah, exactly. AI. I want. I want. I wanna... Yeah. Um, yeah, I think I think there's going to be more. There are, you know, I think there will be AI is like a critical um, kind of domestic capability. You know, like, uh, and I think it's. Um, we're fortunate in America, anyways, that we have like the lead on AI and um, kind of these large language models and, and different kinds of, kinds of models. And I think it's like uh, we should be, you know, it's like a, it's it's kind of important in creating our own ensuring domestic security. You know, so I I feel like um, it's kind of like a, a huge frontier. I think that there's like the there's kind of like the obvious applications which are maybe more like the types of stuff that palantir is doing or like date you know like um information like a uh, processing for large large amounts of information um but i think the one thing one that i'm more interested in is like our our national security around like particularly around um you know how like we enable foreign governments to communicate directly into the minds of americans like on at scale with like customized messaging i think that's like the thing that we're like the things that are like more like traditional theaters of combat i think like america like america's military system is like pretty good at like under you know seeing what's coming and upgrading our capabilities and that i think is like a new theater that we don't like really like know what to do about you know because like freedom of communication is, is like kind of a cornerstone of our democracy and so like we you know it's hard to like you know the lines between like yeah i mean when you're when you're online you're like like it's like really hard to tell whether people are just talking you know there's like random americans talking like saying insane stuff or if it's like foreign agents boosting that message messaging you know I think that's the biggest, you know, to me, that's like one of the biggest questions and it imperils our democracy to allow, you know, kind of like uh, foreign influence over like what people think. I think that's like, um, I think that's pretty, you know, that's like our, it's, it's, it's a existential question in my mind. I think um, I'll, I'll go one, uh, I'll go, I'll just go pragmatic on that. I'll kind of bring, make it real today. Um, it's possible to impersonate people's voices, right? Potentially, they're you know potentially videos of them. Like the amount of spear phishing that's going to happen in the next like few years is like insane to think about, right? Like, so you get a call. It sounds like you know your sister, your mother, your daughter, whatever, right? And like um, you know your your family member, and like and you know, hey, I'm in trouble. I need X. Like how are you going to differentiate that? I actually texted my, my family and I was like, if you're ever going to call from me, like demanding something, hang up and call me back. Right. Call me directly. Cause it's, it's AI has gotten to the point where you can basically impersonate people. And, um, you know, even if it's not happening to you directly, like someone's calling up your phone company and, and, and doing the same thing. I don't know if like, seems like face ID is going to get cracked soon. Right. I can't I, I can't imagine that, you know, the Apple stuff is actually better than whatever AI is able to generate. And so so I, I think like the I think there's two things. It's the, I, you know, personalization. Yes. And all the things. Amazing. It also means that like you being exploited can also be personalized. Right. Like someone can go figure out exactly, you know, kind of riffing off what Justin said around, like changing the way the hearts and minds people like someone can go figure out exactly, you know, what you've been tweeting, what you've been reading, and essentially customize an argument specifically directed towards you to incept you with an idea. Now, you know, it's I think it's more far fetched than, than some of the other things I mentioned, but like it's 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 there, right? And so um and so I you know I I, I think the dystopian stuff is 
I don't think that's yeah. far fetched. I mean, people believe some dumb shit. People believe really insane ideas like QAnon and stuff like that in America, and that's not even personalized to people. You know, like yeah. that's like yeah. Um, you should everybody should create a code word like uh with their family. You know, mine is purple. Mm-hmm. So if you ever try to you know if you call my parents and you say purple, they're gonna send you a Western Union immediately. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So we got a, I like this a couple, other question though. That yeah, oh, yeah I was just sorry, gonna, go ahead. Yeah, I was just just going to segue into that. We've got a couple minutes left, and to flip the coin, what anti fragile alternatives to dystopian directions might be possible? I mean, I think that's like the question of the world, or one of them, which is like because I think there's a lot of dystopian directions of AI. You know, you the foreign governments using it to mass surveil their citizenry or like score them um other things that are like very 1984 and like terrible and i think um you know the antidote to that is like unfortunately like belief in liberalism everywhere is falling like in america too and you know we need to like reground ourselves in the values of liberty like that's important if you like living in places where that you know the 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 consequences of that are you know free thought and um i think that's like super important and we need to like you know like that used to be really important to americans and, and people in the west and i think that's like um it needs to be like reinculturated you know um and that's to me that's that's the antidote like it's kind of like everybody's civic duty to um, propagate and protect those values. I think some of our dystopian concerns, sorry, I have like a, a gardener is literally right outside my door. I don't know if you can hear me, but uh, You're great. <laughs> I think, I mean, some of these concerns have always been around, like with every new technology, with every new technology frontier, there are things that are good and things that are not. and I think all we can really do is build and create and see what happens and think critical thinking is helpful and crucial and being able to fix our educational systems is super important, but I don't think we can slow down technological progress or technological direction because we're worried about all of the bad things that can happen. Well, that's certainly the approach we're taking now. It's just like blind optimism, full force, lean downhill, go into it, right? Um, uh, and, and the unfortunate thing is because of the prisoners to love on this stuff, this, that's like kind of the only real option, right? Like if we don't do it, then it's going to be a, you know, some other organization or state and potentially one that's got less of, you know, kind of this, this tilt towards making a positive outcome. So um the uh you know and when, when we think about like you know what's the like what, what's the antidote to this stuff um it you know i i think the, the when we think about like the risks of ai it's really about like timing right so like with um fake news and with like social media like you know we as a culture kind of learned how to like start to you know, not like, I don't know if you guys remember, like when the internet first came out, like someone would like email you and be like, Hey, can I get your credit card number? And then people would like respond to that. They would like give you the credit card number because they're like, the idea of safety wasn't like a thing. People believed what they read. And over time, people got more and more skeptical of phishing attacks became harder and harder and harder. Then social media came out and then we had this idea of fake news and this idea that your feed was like kind of generated to, to, to specific to you. And so like, my belief is that like, you know, what we're eventually going to need is, is, is more like automated tools that essentially help you disseminate between truth and non-truth. Um, you know, the stuff that Twitter is doing right now with like the the notes, if you guys see these things, they show up on tweets, which is like below, it's like, you know, the context. I think this stuff's super important, it needs to be auto-generated, right? And so um, I, I think we'll start to see things like that where like, information is not just paired it's not just the information itself it's paired with a lot more context and i think that's potentially one way of at least slowing this down but again it's an arms race right like can the ability to generate you know um 
uh, you know, the dystopian version of the future be, it's, it's like the cheating bot, right? Is there any, is there such a thing as, it's, it's like that, but like with our lives instead. So same problem. Nice. That's amazing. Thank you. What I'm loving about this conversation is that it's actually starting to morph into further into the series that we're going to be running. So we're actually going to be running more conversations where this has started to go. We just wanted to start it with like we have today, gaming, AI and gaming and about into startups. But uh, we've actually got a lot of fellows that are in, we actually got one on the call actually, um, in regulation around AI. So that's an area that we'll morph into. But the next session that we're going to run, I'm just throwing it in there, is uh, in June. June the, what have I got there, June the 7th, and that's kind of about the impact of um, AI in New Zealand, so that's sort of the human risk side of it, um, and Chris will be moderating that panel with some more of our fellows, but right now I just want to thank Justin, Rihanna, and Amit for an amazing conversation, it's been really cool, and Chris, great moderation, so if you didn't get that, that's Ben's Bites is a really cool sort of a link to have, but otherwise, thank you everyone for turning up, and hopefully see you on June the 7th for the next conversation. Kai kite anō. Goodbye. Thank you. See you all. Thank you. <laughs>